Welcome to Canada. We are so excited and honored to have you, Imam Tohidi, from Australia visiting us. Thank you very much, Sister Rahil. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and it's good to be in Canada. Thank you. So uh, you have had a lot of time to think. You are a person of great experience, uh, a person of great knowledge. So uh, I wanted to ask you that do you think that uh, the kind of uh, foreign funding that is in coming into countries like Canada, the United Kingdom, America, Australia, from countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar and Iran. Do you think that this foreign funding uh, can in any way be harmful for the countries that we live in? To begin with, foreign funding that threatens uh, Australia, Canada and the United States is always foreign funding that comes from countries that have an agenda. Countries that have an agenda to push their revolutions, their ideologies into other societies within other countries. Therefore that is harmful because obviously countries fund each other for humanitarian causes and so on. But it is wrong to use that ex as an excuse to push your agenda in other people's countries. When looking at Muslim governments, all Muslim governments have a special budget for Sharia law. All of them. They have a special budget, whether it be through books, through schools, through establishing organizations. They all have a special budget which they use to spread their ideology around the world. I believe this is not only threatening, I believe it's damaging for the other communities within other countries. And that is basically because in the Muslim world, a Muslim citizen living in Canada can be a Canadian citizen. However, this very Muslim still belongs to the Muslim Ummah. So he's a Canadian citizen, but if the Mufti of Mecca issues a fatwa for him to commit an act, he will do that on Canadian soil. And the ground that prepares such an ideology for them in Canada is the foreign funding. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you are in Canada at a very interesting time for the Muslim communities of Canada. You may be aware that the Canadian government has just passed a motion. It is called M103. It has been in the works for over a year now. And this is a motion that gives uh, a suggestion that Muslims are uh, being, uh, being attacked or there is a rampant bigotry and racism against Muslims. And of of course, this has created the term Islamophobia. Um, and this is not something that is just in Canada, as you may be aware, all across the Western world, the term Islamophobia is used. I'd like to know what you think about the term Islamophobia, and do you think genuinely that Muslims are being persecuted in the West? I think that the term in itself was introduced as a political mean uh, to be played as the victim card because we're both, we're both Muslim and there are many Muslims that we deal with on a daily basis. The term Islamophobia would be more suitable to be applied between Muslims rather than between Muslims and non-Muslims. We Muslims have been killing each other for the past 1,400 years, literally 1,400 years. We massacred the family of our own prophet. We conducted invasions from Arabia to Africa down to Asia. We've done everything no other religion has done when it comes to crimes and so on, all in the name of religion. Yes, we condemn. We, we don't like what, what happened in history, but it's part of history. And because you have such a, a history engraved within the Muslim identity, it becomes very interesting how all of a sudden the person who belongs to a belief system that is in need of urgent reformation because of the amount of violence within it turns around to be the most oppressed victim in a country like Canada. How this happens, I don't know. I don't want to turn around and blame uh, the Prime Minister for everything or any government that, that is suffering from these uh, waves. But what I do have to say 
from my perspective is that the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamist organizations have played their cards so well and in such a calculated way that they have reached the offices of great leaders and now they are feeding them with wrong advice about everything. And the M103 is part of the problem. It's not like it's part of the solution. M103, in my opinion, violates free speech. If we really cared about minorities, and which is our duty as Muslims to care about minorities from a religious perspective, we would have filed for a similar M103 in Muslim countries, for the Jews and Christians at least. So that the world can see how they will be treated if they wanted to, to play the victim card like we are playing in, in the West. I disagree with it strongly and I believe it is a very divisive motion. It's a motion that doesn't carry any logic behind it and there's no result. You can never seal my mouth if I want to criticize someone or an Islamic script or a book that teaches fundamental teachings. The M103 can never silence me. Uh, there are people that believe in, 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 a rev in, in a reformation that is coming and these uh, motions will never be able to stop that. All what these motions are doing, they are slowing down the eradication of fundamentalist teachings and Islamic extremism. That's all what they are doing. You use the term reformation. How do you see this reformation and do you see it happening across the Muslim world or only in the West? No, reform is a, is, a, is a real concept. It's happening and it, it happened to all Abrahamic religions before uh, Islam. And Islam claims itself to be part of, of the Abrahamic faith. It associates itself with that uh, chain of, of Abrahamic religions. And all of them have undergone a reformation, a successful reformation. Uh, and there's no reason why Islam will not undergo its reformation. However, Islam's reformation will be very unique. Unique in the sense that reformation cannot take place through the clerical organizations, through the mullahs in power, or through Islamic governments. Because they're all corrupt. They are all corrupt. No one can point to any Islamic government and say, this is a good Islamic government. It has never beheaded, it has never raped, it has never killed, it has never exiled, it has never imprisoned journalists, it has never banned free speech. It doesn't exist. All Islamic governments are guilty of these crimes. Therefore, a reformation cannot take place through Islamic governments even if Islamic governments wanted to assist. An Islamic reformation will take place, in my opinion, through the Muslims that traveled, or in other words, fled Muslim countries, came to the West, came to even more liberal Muslim societies such as Dubai, which is a democratic society, but it has a Muslim majority. But Sharia law doesn't rule, they don't behead. So Saudi Arabia, for example, it beheads people. The very ruling in uh, UAE, uh, Emirates, and for example, Kuwait, it's frowned upon. Nobody beheads in those areas. Therefore, there's a big difference between a Muslim nation governed by democracy and a Muslim government, an Islamic government based on Sharia law. Reformation, in my opinion, will take place because there are Muslims that have fled these theocratic environments and have come to the West and have realized that living with other people is possible. Having peaceful relationships with other religions is possible. Interfaith opens doors for achieving, achieving global peace. Therefore, why not? And these people will be the main reason for the Islamic reform. We need to work with them, we need to champion them, we need to give them our platforms. At the same time, we must not forget one very important fact, and that is, when we are working for Islamic reform, there are people that are working to take back Islam 1,400 years the other way. So we are up against an uphill battle, but it is a battle we shall win, definitely, because all of the matters that are happening around the world show that everything is in our favor. The world isn't full of people who hate Islam. The world is full of people who hate the radicals from every religion, the KKK, the other cults, uh, orthodox uh, uh, fundamentalist preachers from other religions that have isolated themselves and, and believe in beheading. Uh, and we have them, the Wahhabis and the Salafis and the fundamentalists as well. And the world is uniting against them. Therefore, the key to reformation is that we 
moderate, peaceful individuals, Muslims, need to unite with them against the fundamentalists from within our own faith. That is the only way we can achieve reformation. Obviously, there are many other chapters and uh, aspects and also angles one can look at Islamic reformation through. Uh, however, it is a real issue, it's happening, and uh, we are not the first to, to speak about Islamic reform. Islamic reform has been uh, a matter of concern for the Muslim world and Muslim philosophers and thinkers from the 5th century. Uh, sorry, since 500 years, since uh, five centuries ago. Uh, and uh, for the last 500 years, we, we've been uh, dealing with uh, people from Sudan uh, who have claimed to be reformers and were killed. Uh, there are many reformers around the world, even in Britain, even the, the Cameliers that came to Australia, the Afghan Cameliers. All of them had a vision for reform and they married into different communities and so on. The, the integration and diversity is real and it's, uh, it's a matter that can be achieved and I support it strongly. However, we say to the Western world, be patient with us. Be patient. Uh, we, we come from a broken uh, religion, a religion completely infested with Islamic radicals, we don't have an organized leadership body. Be patient with us. Don't expect an Islamic reformation like the reformation of Christianity. The popes gather and the church gathers and the people gather and they say, okay, the benefit is this and let's do it. No. There will be lots of blood spilled before an actual reformation happens. Many people will lose power. Many politicians will gain power who have uh, uh, liberal and secular views. Therefore, we say to Western governments, it's not a, a dream, it's not something we're imagining, it's something we're living. Be patient with us. Thank you. Um, that's, that's very inspiring. And on a personal note, do you think that Muslim women have a role to play in this reformation? Sister Rahil, I believe that if there's a Muslim woman that will play a main role in this whole issue of reformation, it is yourself. In my honest opinion, if there is one Muslim woman that is inspiring Muslim women, men and women, in this issue, uh, it is yourself, and I congratulate you on that. Thank you very much. That wasn't uh, where I was leading to, but thank you very much for that. But, you know, you talked about integration and global peace, and, and you have mentioned more than once that it's important for the Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam to work together, to learn from each other, to have dialogue. But you obviously must be aware also that there is this strong rise of anti-Semitism. In the Muslim world, there is a feeling of angst against the Jews, against uh, the existence of Israel. How do you think Muslims should overcome this, uh, this prejudice they have, this idea that everything in the world is a conspiracy theory by the Zionists? Uh, in my opinion, if there was any uh, interference from the non-Muslims into the Muslim world, for example, the previous American administration did fund ISIS, but it did not create ISIS. There's a big difference between creating and funding. Funding means you use your enemy against another enemy. That's what government policy means to protect the government in the terminologies of government policy, you use one enemy against the other. From a religious perspective, they haven't created anything. The Zionists haven't created anything, and the Americans haven't created anything. We already had the problem within our books. All what we did was show here. Therefore, the hatred that we have as Muslims against the Jewish people, I'm a Shia Muslim, our, the, the problem of the Shia Muslims against the Jews, or Israel, or the, any, anyone for that matter, began after 1979. Shia Muslims don't claim land from Israel, and Israel doesn't claim land from us. The Jewish people don't want anything from us, and we don't want anything from them. They lived in Tehran, in Iraq, and we have cemeteries that, that prove their existence on this land. And there are many Muslims that have lived within uh, the Palestinian region, which is now governed by the Jewish people. We don't have a problem with them. It is after the Khomeini revolution that everybody started to scream Al-Quds, Al-Quds. And Al-Quds doesn't belong to us. We have nothing to do with Al-Quds. We Shia Muslims, we have nothing to do with Al-Quds. It was built by the, the second caliph 
and the Umayyad dynasty. We reject both the second caliph and the Umayyad dynasty. And we don't even believe the Prophet went to Palestine. Masjid al-Aqsa, there's a big debate whether or not Masjid al-Aqsa, the farthest mosque, the furthest mosque, the very far mosque, that's the term, Aqsa. There's a big debate whether this is on earth or in the heavens because of its name. There's no proof that our Prophet went to uh, Palestine at all. Yes, the direction was, the direction of the prayer was towards Jerusalem only because Jerusalem is very sacred to all Abrahamic faiths, especially the Jewish people. I believe if we can basically open the books of history and show the Muslims that Moses was before Jesus, a very logical matter. I don't see where the problem is. Moses was before Jesus. So how can we claim Palestine is ours when it is Jewish land? In the Quran it's Jewish land. According to history is Jewish land. In fact, if there is any human civilization or any religion that wants to claim Jerusalem, it would be the Christians, not us. Between the Muslims and the Christians, there's a massive uh, religion in between, a major religion, Christianity. And their prophet came, the, the leader, Jesus, the, the founder of their faith came in, uh, our prophet and their founder came in Jerusalem. So it's basically their Mecca. If anyone wanted to claim it, it would be them, not us. We have nothing there. We don't have the grave of our prophet and we don't have the Ahlul Bayt. We don't have anything in Jerusalem. All we have is certain prophets that don't belong to us. They belong to all Abrahamic uh, people. So this uh, need to dominate and dominate was introduced by these uh, terrorists, Hamas and uh, Yasser Arafat and these people. Uh, even though the Muslims, they love them, they love them because of personal interest. That's the main reason why we used to love them too. For personal interest, it was good. But if you want to be honest to yourself, honestly, what does Islam have to do with Jerusalem? How did Islam come to Jerusalem? Through the invasions, led by Umar ibn Khattab, who kidnapped the governor of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem. He took him to Medina and then brought him back on a horse and he gave him the keys to the city and it was all done with. This is the only time we enter Jerusalem, by the sword. And it, we have nothing to do in that land, literally nothing. And these very, uh, the very domes, uh, al ports and Aqsa, these need to be demolished. I know what I'm saying is very serious, but these need to be demolished. According to Islamic law, they need to be demolished. Not according to human rights or, or foreign uh, policy or, or we say Jewish have uh, uh, sacred sites under them. I couldn't care less who has a sacred sites under this. I'm saying, according to Islam, you cannot pray on occupied land. How can you build God's mosque on, on occupied land? According to our own jurisprudence as Muslims, Sunni and Shia, it's occupied land. Uh, prayer there is not accepted. So they need to be uh, dealt with. Either there's a peace treaty, or you can't uh, keep uh, the situation going on like this. It's an invasion. So uh, Osama bin Laden built mosques. Saddam Hussein built mosques. It doesn't mean that every mosque is, is a good symbol that we need to fight for. And also, there's an attitude within the Muslim world that every person that dies for the cause of Islam needs to be glorified and we build them a, a tomb and a shrine and so on. No, it doesn't work like that. The ones who deserve shrines are the infallibles, uh, according to Shia Islam and the family of the Prophet, according to Ahl-Sunnah and Jama'ah. All other Sahaba and uh, people and uh, Tabi'een and uh, historians and uh, Bukhari, why are we building them graves? Why are we building them tombs? I don't believe in that personally. And uh, also, you know, we, we've been building too many across the whole uh, Middle East and the Arabian Gulf and wherever. Uh, we, we've stopped and, you know, people are waking up. They say, this land doesn't belong to you. You came at the very end of this whole chain of religions. So how can you claim authority over all of what's here? It's very hard. It's not an argument one can sell. Very hard. Historically, politically, geographically, even Islamically. It's very hard to sell this argument that Palestine is ours. It's not ours. How did it become ours? The, Pal the Palestinian Muslims in Jerusalem today, the original Palestinians, not the migrants to Palestine, the original Palestinians are descendants from two major religions, either Christianity or Judaism. 
So if a Palestinian chooses to convert to Islam by the sword or by the book, only your religion changes. The identity of the land doesn't change. You want to become Muslim? Go become Muslim. You want to become a Buddhist? Become Buddhist. It doesn't mean, mean you make all Palestine Buddhists with you. It doesn't work like that. You change. So now the Muslims in Palestine are Muslims living on Jewish land. And this is the fact, historically, geographically. This is how it is. We cannot change it. Jew, Jewish land is one thing. Zionism is another thing. There are Jewish people who oppose Israel. There are Jews who, who are against Israel. And Israel welcomes it. Big deal. Every government has an opposition. Let's not get mixed up. Israel is a country is one thing. Jewish land is another thing. Israel has every right to be in, uh, uh, to have a country on Jewish land. It's their land. It's their land. And uh, what do we have now from Palestine? Show me one good thing from Palestine. All what they have given us, Muslim Brotherhood and, and Hizb al-Tahrir and Hamas, and their rulers are robbing them. These are the facts. And I, I uh, strongly believe in good relationships with the Jewish community. Strongly. Uh, because the reality is, we are all brothers in humanity at the end of the day. If we're not brothers in faith, we're brothers and sisters in humanity. And I believe the, this is a battle that our, our forefathers started. Decades ago, they wanted to start a problem. Why do the upcoming generations still have to suffer and continue that problem? I believe, whether it be a two-state solution or whatever, depending on the politicians and, and their uh, belief for the future, but I believe that interfaith is very uh, important relations between the two religions and uh, we obviously work in that field. Thank you, thank you. So um, Imam Tawhidi, I find that you are extremely outspoken, you are extremely frank, honest and you uh, bring up issues that are very challenging for the status quo of the Muslims. You must have received a lot of feedback and pushback and hostility. Can you speak about that and how do you deal with it? Yes, uh, we receive lots of threats, feedback, recommendations, whatever. One, it's, it, it is difficult, but it's also expected. You don't enter a field like this not expecting it. There are some good stories, there are some sad stories, but at the end of the day, you're moving forward. You can't uh, expect to grow a rose without thorns. It's impossible. Everything has a price. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's just uh, taking the thorns away from the stem. And we, we, we're living. Uh, up until now I've made it. And uh, our message is getting across. But the thing is, Islamic Reformation doesn't depend on me. I can uh, go. Very normal. I could be in a car accident tomorrow. The reform will happen. And there will be many people that will come in, in the future like me. Uh, this isn't uh, a miracle. People realize that if they need to change the situation that they're in and they're rising and, and this is something we welcome. So yes, it's very expected. You'll make many sacrifices, you'll lose lots of friends and family members, but it's worth it at the end of the day. You're saving humanity. You're doing everything you can to save humanity. Let's put it that way. So, um, I, in ending, I want to ask you what is your recommendation for Muslim communities, for Muslims at large? What should they do? Maybe three things that they should be doing to build this movement, to move ahead, to live in peace with each other. I believe uh, one of the main reasons why peace is achieved or how peace is achieved is if we stop linking ourselves with governments back home. So if I'm Syrian and Syria is at war, it doesn't mean I become a uh, political activist for my country in, in the West and I start losing friends and family because they don't agree with me. If I'm a Muslim and I have a satellite channel and I see things happening in the Middle East, it doesn't mean I make what I see on TV my agenda when I go outside in the Muslim community. Things don't work like that. Another issue is understanding that the West doesn't tolerate this uh, hatred in the Middle East you see something on TV you protest in the street everybody knows what you're talking about it's a closed society Every, everything is connected here you can't see something on TV go outside and want to start problems people won't know what you want and you, you only bring fear in their hearts and unrest in the community I think 
in order to achieve peace, something that's very doable, Muslims need to separate themselves with what is happening back home. The Middle East will always have problems from the beginning of, of human time up until now and until the end of time. The Middle East will never be free from problems. If we want to live in the West peacefully, stop linking yourself with the problems in the Middle East. Yes, condemn the terrorism, condemn the problems, write articles how we can achieve solu solutions, but don't expect to be a political activist for Saudi Arabia or Iran in Canada. That's very wrong. That's not your duty. That's not your responsibility. You're a citizen who abides by the Canadian law. Respect the Canadian law. Respect the Australian law. There's no need for you to turn into a political activist because you see a video on YouTube and now you want to bring down Western civilization and you want to attack the disbelievers and the Jews. And it doesn't work like that. Separate between the two and live your life honorably. God gave you the opportunity to come to Australia, Canada, America. Use that opportunity to be a better human being. You cannot be a better human being from where you came from. Otherwise, you wouldn't have come. The main reason why you say, I've come for a better life, better life makes you a better human being. Therefore, live it and enjoy it. Smile, be happy, enjoy the healthy lifestyle. Uh, don't live like you hate the world you are living in. And that's unfortunately one of the main problems that they are facing. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank for having you. me. Pleasure to hear you speak. I wish you well. I, I pray that you stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And continue the work. Likewise. And we look forward to doing something together. Inshallah. Likewise. Likewise. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much.